Welcome to Medium in Conversation. Thanks for joining us. I'm Amy Shern, Senior Editor at Medium's Personal Development Publication, Forge. I'm so happy to be here with Nir Ayal, author of the best-selling book, Indistractable. Nir writes, consults, and teaches about the intersection of psychology, technology, and business. And Nir has taught at Stanford, has co-founded and sold two tech companies, and is the author of two best-selling books, Hooked, How to Build Habit-Forming Products, and Indistractable, How to Control Your Attention and Choose Your Life. And probably most significantly, I'm guessing, he's a frequent contributor to Forge. Hi, Nir. Thanks so much for being here. Hey, Amy. Great to see you. Um, thanks for joining us tonight or this morning for you because you're in Singapore and time is not real. <laughs> That's right. I'm, right. I'm in the future. I'm in tomorrow. <laughs> How is it? Tell us. Tomorrow's great. It's going to be a great day tomorrow. You're going to love it. Everything's better, right? <laughs> exactly. Everything's better. <laughs> I'm so glad to hear that. Um, I mean, my first question for you is like, how did you get here? You've been called the prophet of habit forming technology. You're the habits guy. You've become like a guru of fighting distraction. Um, do you think 10 year old Nir would have expected to be writing about how to avoid distraction? Like, would your fourth grade teacher be surprised or think, oh no, this makes sense. This is this guy's trajectory. <laughs> That's a really great question, actually. <laughs> uh, I've never been asked that before, but um, uh, yes and no, actually. So I'll take the no part first. So uh, English is not my first language. I'm an immigrant to the United States and uh, uh, language arts was never my specialty because I'm dyslexic. So it was always a real struggle. I got straight C's and D's as a fourth grader. <laughs> so I, it was very difficult for me. Um, uh, but yes, in that um, fourth grade near was also uh, obese. Uh, I was, uh, I remember my, my mom taking me to the doctor and the doctor showing me the chart that said, okay, here's normal weight, here's overweight, and here's you, you're all the way in this, in this obese category. And uh, so I, I was clinically obese uh, up until adulthood. And um, uh, I think in that respect, that's where my fascination around how things outside of us seem to influence and persuade us. Uh, and I, I became fascinated by uh, why was it that food seemed to have control over me? Why was it so difficult for me to, uh, to, to, to say I was gonna eat one thing and I would end up binging on other stuff? Um, and so I think that, that kind of started this fascination with, with persuasion through products. And I, I think it was that, probably that was the spark of, of my current line of research. Wow, that's fascinating. Um, and like another book, just say, <laughs> Maybe. you probably don't need any extra ideas, but um, that's really interesting. Always looking, maybe that might not be a bad idea. <laughs> All right, let's talk after this. Um, yeah, maybe yeah. there's an essay, All right, we'll get started on it. Um, I love how you wrote in the book and on Forge about how you got distracted while writing Indistractable. Uh, on Forge, you wrote that it took you five years to write your book. And uh, I'm just gonna quote you to yourself because that's a comfortable feeling I know. Um, <laughs> my book Indistractable is about how to stop getting distracted. Ironically, the problem was that I kept getting distracted. That is until I learned the key to finally doing what I set out to do. First of all, I really appreciated that you admitted <laughs> to getting distracted while writing this book because it was deeply satisfying as a reader. Um, and so interesting. What was the key? How did you learn it? Yeah. Why do I write this stuff? Oh, my gosh. I'm, I reveal too much. <laughs> no, it's perfect. <laughs> uh, but I thought, I thought it was important to, to be very honest with people that I write books not because I have the answer, but because I'm looking for the answer. I mean, that's why I write on Medium is the same thing. I'm, I'm chewing through these life problems. And the way that I found, uh, you know, my therapy is uh, talking through the problem, researching the problem, figuring out an answer to the problem, and then kind of sharing what I'm learning in real time. And so, uh, that I, you know, it's been such a pleasure to, to uh, work with you all at Medium and to, to share with the audience on Medium because you get such feedback and insights, you know, from people saying, oh, I, I have that struggle too. Or did you see this piece of research? Or did you think about this? Or no, you're totally wrong on that. 
that's kind of become part of my writing process uh, of, of kind of putting stuff out there, uh, you know, when it's still early on, on Medium and Forge and, uh, and then kind of working through it. And then eventually it becomes the book. And that was the same uh, method that I used with Indistractable as well. And part of the reason it took me so long to write Indistractable was because I was very distracted. I mean, that's why I wrote the book. Um, partially because my first book, I didn't have this struggle. Uh, when I wrote Hooked, um, uh, you know, I was, I, nobody was calling, nobody was asking me to speak at their events. Uh, you know, I was, I was doing a little bit of consulting work, but I had a lot of time on my hands. Uh, and it was, it, I, it was relatively easy to write that book. Um, with Indistractable, now, you know, the, the quote unquote success of the first book meant that I had more emails in my inbox and more meetings to take and more commitments. And it, I found it really hard to focus on the one thing that had made me successful uh, in terms of my writing career, which was the actual writing. And then not only did it spill over, uh, I'm sorry, not only did it affect my, my profession, but it also spilled over into other areas of my life. So there was this one seminal moment uh, that really made me reassess my own relationship with distraction. Uh, shortly after I'd published Hooked, um, I, I had a, a day with my daughter. Uh, just a, a, a fun day together, just to be, you know, to daddy daughter time. And um, we had this activity book of things that, you know, dads and daughters could do together, uh, you know, a Sudoku puzzle, uh, make an origami crane, all these little activities to, to bring us closer together. And I remember that there was one question in this book that I'll never forget. The question was that we were supposed to ask each other was, if you could have any superpower, what superpower would you want? And I remember that question verbatim, but I can't tell you what my daughter said. Because in that moment, I don't even remember why, but for some reason, I started checking my phone. And by the time I looked up for my device, I realized she was gone. She <laughs> left the room because she'd gotten the clear message that I was sending that whatever was on here was more important than she was. And I blew it. And so that's when I realized that I had to reassess my own relationship with distraction, uh, not just distraction with my daughter. Uh, that, that was terrible. That, that hit home. Uh, by the way, can I tell you a quick aside real quick? Um, I remember I told this story to a friend of mine when I was struggling with this problem. And I was pretty embarrassed and, and you know, I wanted to see how he was dealing with it because he has a daughter of similar age. Our kids play together. And so he later on asked his own daughter, the same question, what superpower would you want? He was just kind of curious. And she said that she'd want the power to talk to animals. And he said, oh, that's interesting, power to talk to animals. What, why is that? And his little girl looks up to, to him and says, so that when you and mommy are on your phones, I'll have someone to talk to. No. <laughs> All right, that could just be an expert level troll. Like kids right. are very savvy these days. She's like, just why don't you give me my night. own phone? Exactly. <laughs> They're in so, yeah. So you know, that just reinforced that it wasn't just me who was struggling with this. It wasn't, it was also other people. And frankly, it wasn't just with my daughter, right? It was when I was at my desk and I'd say, okay, I'm definitely gonna work on that big project. I'm gonna finish that blog post. Here I go, I'm gonna do it. And I do something else. Uh, it would happen certainly with my weight. You know, my 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 weight has always been uh, a struggle for me. And I, you know, started gaining weight because I wasn't eating what I said I would eat. I wasn't working out when I said I would. I wasn't spending time with with the friends that I said I would invest in. And what I realized, my big aha moment was that I was, you know, I knew very clearly what I needed to do. Right? We all know what to do. If you want to be in shape, you don't need to buy a diet book. You just eat right and exercise. We know this. Who doesn't know that chocolate cake is not as healthy as a salad, right? We know that. Who doesn't know that if you want better relationships, you have to be fully present with the people you love. We know that. Who doesn't know that if you want to be great at your job, guess what? You got to do the work, especially the hard stuff that other people don't want to do. We know what to do. What we don't know is how do we stop getting in our own way? How do we stop getting distracted? And so that's why this title for the book, this word that I made up, indistractable, sounds like indestructible. It's meant to sound like a superpower because that was the superpower that I most wanted. That's great. I love that. And um, I, I love how you write about sort of common mind traps that we all fall into. As you're saying, you know, we know what to do. Uh, the question is how to convince ourselves to actually do it. Um, and what do you think are some of the most common mind traps that, that we fall into that make us susceptible to distraction? 
Oh, there are so many. Uh, I think the, 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 the biggest is that we are present bias, that we are really bad at thinking about long-term decisions. We're not, we're not, well, we're the best of any other animal in the world, right? There is no other creature on the face of the earth that can see into the future like we can. I mean, that's the very definition of intelligence, that we can solve these problems well out into the future, right? No other animal can plan like we can. That is the evolutionary adaptation, one of our ed evolutionary adaptations that makes us really special, right? We can predict what is going to happen with higher fidelity than any other animal. But in the moment, our urges uh, sometimes get the best of us. That really what it's about, it's about immediate gratification uh, at the expense of future reward. So it requires a, a good deal of planning. It requires forethought that um, our, our tendency towards um, distraction, towards doing things in the present moment that feel good, even though we know it's against our long-term interests, that, that, that is something that we all do, right? We would rather have that chocolate cake right now as opposed to uh, you know, being in good shape later. We'd rather spend that cash as opposed to saving up for retirement. Uh, we'd rather scroll Facebook right now as opposed to working on that big project that we're procrastinating on, right? Like we want the immediate gratification. That's probably the biggest tendency that we have to fight against, which is, which is really crazy if you think about it because we're only hurting ourselves in these circumstances. Right, and, and this is not a new phenomenon, by the way. This is not something that Facebook or the iPhone created. You know, 2,500 years ago, the Greek philosopher Plato talked about this exact same problem. He called it akrasia in the Greek, the tendency to do things against our better interest, that when we know we need to do one thing, why don't we just do it? Why do we keep punching ourselves in the face, making silly decisions now uh, that, that, that hurt us in the future? And so it's all about really impulse control that that's really the seminal skill to overcome uh, these, these short-term poor decisions is learning how to control those impulses. Because we know, again, we know what to do. It's about making sure that, that our, 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 the better angels of our nature win, that we do the things that benefit us over the long-term versus just short-term rewards. Yeah, I love how you write about how it's all, the how far we'll go to avoid discomfort. Mm. And you sort of make a distinction between, you know, it's not necessarily that we're looking for even pleasure or avoiding pain, but we're just, we'll go out of our way to avoid discomfort, even if that discomfort is just like the possibility of failure or, you know, something not working out the way we want it to. Yeah. Or boredom. Boredom's a, a big one. Uh, there was that fascinating study by Timothy Wilson at Harvard, where he, he asked participants to just sit in a room with nothing to do but strapped to their arm was a band that they were told would deliver a painful electrical shock if they pushed on a button. And all he said was just sit in this room. Okay. He didn't say push the button, don't push the button. He just said, sit here. But so you know, if you push the button, you're going to get a painful electrical shock. Okay. Two thirds of men and one third of women would rather shock themselves with a stimulus they knew was going to be painful than to sit in silence with their feelings. Yeah. And so this is, this is an incredibly important insight. And for me, this really blew my mind because my whole perception of why we do what we do was, was kind of shaken. You know, I think I, I had the perception, as I think most people do, that human motivation is about carrots and sticks, right? We've all heard that metaphor, that it's about the pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain. Sigmund Freud called it the pleasure principle. Jeremy Bentham talked about this. This is an old idea. We've all heard it. But neurologically speaking, it's not true. It's not true that human behavior is not about the pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain, but rather everything we do, we only do for one reason. And that's the desire to escape discomfort. Everything you do is just about the desire to escape discomfort. So physiologically, this is really obvious, right? If you um, go outside and it's cold, the brain says, uh oh, this doesn't feel good. You should put on a coat. If uh, you go back inside now, it's too hot. The brain says, oh, okay, now we're overheating. You should take off your coat. If you're hungry, you feel hunger pangs. So you eat. And if you eat too much, oh, now you feel stuffed. The brain says, stop eating. So physiologically, this is perfectly obvious. This is called the homeostatic response. Psychologically, the same thing is happening, right? So when we feel uh, lonely, check Facebook. When we are uncertain, 
Google, when you're bored, oh my gosh, lots of solutions to boredom, right? We can uh, check uh, the news, Pinterest, stock prices, sports scores, lots and lots of things take us out of this uncomfortable emotional state. But that therefore means if all human behavior is prompted by a desire to escape discomfort, when we understand that fact, therefore time management requires pain management. Time management requires pain management. That if we don't understand what is that underlying discomfort, boredom, loneliness, fatigue, anxiety, stress, whatever that discomfort is, that is the root cause of distraction. It's not your phone, people. It's not that something's broken with your brain. There's nothing wrong with you. You're perfect. It's simply that we haven't learned the skill set to deal with that discomfort in a healthy way. So what most people do when they feel anxious, stressed, bored, lonely, they look for escape, right? Let me just scroll this thing. Let me just drink this substance. Let me just do whatever I can to take my mind off of that feeling. Whereas what indistractable people do is they harness that discomfort. They use it to drive them forward as opposed to looking for escape. So that has to be the first solution. And I think I think everything I had read on this topic, the research that I had done with other popular books was about, you know, grayscale your phone and, you know, like, you know, get rid of Facebook and all this stuff. And it's like, that's not really the solution because the solution is not, it, it, the, the problem is not new. It's a very old problem. The problem is about how do we deal with discomfort first and foremost. Yeah, I love how you write in your book about, you know, the sort of carrot and the stick issue. Um, you write in your book, fun is looking for the variability in something other people don't notice. It's breaking through the boredom and monotony to discover its hidden beauty. And I love the idea that we can find have fun with our current work and responsibilities rather than thinking of fun as something passive that happens later as a reward. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, then, and then it's like we confuse fun for, you know, we're like, oh, okay, I'll, I can scroll through something mindlessly and maybe that will be fun. And so then it's like the work wasn't satisfying and the fun wasn't satisfying. <laughs> Do you feel sure. like you, yeah. like how can we have more fun sort of with the work itself? Yeah, so this is so there's three big pillars to uh, mastering these internal triggers. That's that's the most important first step is learning how to deal with this discomfort. So one thing we can do is to reimagine the internal triggers themselves. Uh, another thing we can do is to reimagine the task, to think of a task differently. That's what you're referring to. And then we can also talk about reimagining our temperament, which we can get to later. But when it comes to reimagining the task, I think you know the book is full of um, of myths and misperceptions around productivity advice. And one of the worst pieces of productivity advice, there are many, many, many we can talk about, like the to-do list, why to-do lists kill your productivity. And what, one of the things that blew my mind as well in the course of this research was this myth around the, what, I, what, what, what we call the Mary Poppins myth, that if you just put a spoonful of sugar, you can, you know, you can make that task enjoyable and fun. And uh, there's, been, there's been quite a bit of research, uh, not, not much of it widely known, that says that for some types of tasks, that's a really bad idea. So the spoonful of sugar idea, uh, the Mary Poppins myth is good for one-time tasks, right? If you just need to get that stuff done, okay, put yourself, give yourself a little reward and you can push through it. But it actually backfires for repeat tasks that what we call extrinsic rewards versus intrinsic rewards actually make people less creative and it degrades their work performance. That if it's a task you have to do again and again and again, you do not want to use the Mary Poppins technique. You don't want to give yourself that spoonful of sugar. Um, and so there, we, what else do you do? And so uh, I, I, I can't take credit for this. You know, everything in the book is backed by peer reviewed studies. There's over 30 pages of citations. It's not just my personal techniques, but one, one uh, uh, researcher that I really appreciated uh, his research around was uh, he, his name is Ian Bogos. He's at Georgia Tech. And he talks about this, I think, pretty revolutionary idea that, that uh, play does not necessarily need to be enjoyable, okay? It doesn't have to be fun. Play doesn't have to be fun. What? what? That doesn't make any sense. What, the, like, is, shouldn't that be part of play? He says not necessarily, that you can learn to play anything, that the goal of play is to harness our attention and our focus long enough to help us power through that task to help us do what we need to do. Because part of the problem, I think, with the productivity and self-help industry is that we're somehow told that everything needs to be enjoyable all the time. 
that the goal is happiness all the time, right? How many books have happiness in the title? That somehow we're told if we're not happy all the time, that something's wrong with us, that we're not pursuing our passion. And that's terrible advice <laughs> because where is this rule written that everything has to be enjoyable all the time? Quite the opposite. That if you think about it from an evolutionary basis, our species evolved to be perpetually perturbed, right? If there was ever a group of homo sapiens who sat around the savanna and said, oh, we're in perfect Zen all the time. Everything's great. Everything's awesome. We're perfectly happy and contented. Let me tell you what would have happened to them. Our ancestors, would, when they met them, would have killed and eaten them, right? <laughs> because you don't want a species to be always contented, always happy. No, it's in fact that drive, that disquietude, that discomfort to make things better that pushes us forward. So the first thing we need to realize is that feeling bad is not bad. Feeling bad is not bad. It's not something we need to run away with by taking our mind off the problem and escaping that discomfort, but rather we can use it as rocket fuel to move us forward. So what, what Bogos tells us to do is not to abandon the task, not to take our mind off the problem, but rather to go more deeply into the task. And, and he says in a few ways, one is to explore it further, to, to know it more intimately and to look for variability. So he talks about how he hated cutting his, his grass, the lawn in his, in, uh, uh, the lawn around his house. He hated this task and he would avoid it and procrastinate on it, he didn't wanna do it. So he applied these techniques from, from the psychology literature around how he could play this task. Now, he still didn't find it enjoyable. He didn't find it fun. He wasn't enjoying you know, cutting the grass, but he looked for how to make that task into play. So he explored it more deeply. He found, okay, what different types of grass grow in my area? And you know, he kind of researched it and got more into the task. And he added constraints and variability. So he started timing himself to see, okay, what was the most efficient path to finish the task as quickly as possible? And so he started making this game through the constraints that he added into that, into that effort. And we see this in our own life many times that, I don't know about you, but some of my most unproductive, unfulfilling days are the ones where I have no constraints. It's like when I wake up and I, on, a, on a weekend, oh, I got the whole day open. I can, I'm going to finish my novel and I'm going to do my taxes and I'm going to call all my relatives. I'm going to do all this stuff and I don't do any of it, right? Because there are no constraints, right? It's just an open day. And so I think this provides further evidence for why adding some constraints to a task and then looking for the variability can actually make that task, any task, into play. Yeah, it's so interesting because it occurs to me that there you could replace play with um, creativity. And I feel like, you know, as you know, from having written books, it's like sometimes we have this idea in our heads that doing something creative should be fun the whole time. Mm -hmm. And if it's mm -hmm. not, then we're not doing it right or it we should just quit because what's the point? Um, but it's like making anything is, it's not going to be fun all the time. It's not going to be pleasurable or not uncomfortable the whole time, but that's part of it. That's, that's getting exactly through right. that is part of the process. Right. And in fact, so what, what people do who are indistractable, who can't sustain, uh, you know, consistent effort. One of my mantras from the book is consistency over intensity, that the people who achieve their life goals they don't do it because they work on it real intensely for a weekend, right? If you want to get in shape, you don't go to the gym for just one month after you make your New Year's resolution. You, you have to work at it consistently, right? Consistency over intensity. And so the people who can stay consistent with anything in their life, investing in their relationships, uh, their work, uh, their, their health, their physical health, their mental health, they put in consistent effort over time. And the, the way they do that, the secret to how they do that is that they they, they know how to deal with the discomfort even when the task isn't fun, even when it's not pleasurable. They keep doing it. They do a little bit, but they keep doing it over years and years, and that's how they, they succeed. And it's, by the way, interestingly enough, it's not about willpower. In fact, one of the popular myths that I overturn in the book is this idea that willpower is a limited resource. In fact, in the psychology community, there's a lot of debate whether willpower even exists, whether it's really a thing that it's not self-control and willpower that, that drives these people forward. It's in fact a system. It's just a default that they set up in their life. And I describe many of these techniques. It's not powering through and, and you know, uh, be, uh, using intense amounts of willpower at all. Um, it's so interesting. It occurs to me that 
in the book and in a lot of your articles that you've written, you talk about, you know, how somebody can focus on what they want to focus on. Um, use the great example in your book of writing book, um, or, you know, if somebody's focusing on work or a big project for work or something like that. Um, what about if they don't know what they want to focus on? What if somebody doesn't even know sort of what they want to, to gain traction on? I love the distinction that you draw between, you know, you say that the opposite of distraction isn't focus, but is traction, which I feel like is so useful to have that sort of metaphor in your brain. But what if you don't know what you're trying to gain traction on? Can that be part of the problem? Absolutely. Because if you don't know what you want to do with your time, uh, I will tell you what will be done with your time. Something you will later regret. Because in this day and age, um, there are so many interests out there that want to turn your time and attention into money, right? That, that we all know this, right? It's going to be Facebook. It's going to be the news. It's going to be your boss. It's going to be your kids. It's going to be somebody who wants your time and attention, it's not going to be, it's not going to default into your higher aspirations. Somebody is going to tell you what to do with your time. If you don't decide what you're going to do with your time, somebody's going to decide for you. And so that's why, you know, this distinction between traction and distraction is so important that when I started writing this book, you know, I, I, I like to make sure we understand our definitions. And I, I didn't, I didn't understand what distraction really was. It was just kind of this term I tossed around, but I didn't really get it. And so I started with, okay, wait a minute, what is distraction? The best way to understand what distraction is, is to understand what it is not. Uh, and so I thought the opposite of distraction was focus. But if you look at the origin of the word, it's actually uh, the opposite of distraction is not focus. It's as you mentioned, the opposite of distraction is traction. That both words come from the same Latin root, trahare, which means to pull. And they both end in the same six letters, A-C-T-I-O-N, that spells action. So traction by definition is any action that pulls you towards what you said you're going to do, things that move you closer to your goals, closer to becoming the kind of person you want to become. The opposite of traction is distraction. Distraction is any action that pulls you further away from what you plan to do, further away from your goals, further away from becoming the kind of person you want to become. So this is really important because anything can be traction or distraction based on intent, based on forethought. So we should not judge these actions based on if they are morally superior or inferior. That's ridiculous. You know, you hear a lot of tech critics telling us, oh, you know, going on social media, that's bad. Playing video games, that's bad. That's frivolous. Don't do that, right? That's rotting your brain. But, uh, oh, uh, watching a football game on TV, that's okay, right? Like, yeah. why? <laughs> why? Why is there this moral hierarchy that I get to tell you what's bad to do with your time, but what I do with my time is okay? No. Anything you want to do with your time, you want to play video games, you want to scroll social media, fine. There's nothing wrong with any of that as long as it's done with intent. The time you plan to waste is not wasted time, as Dorothy Parker said. So as long as that's what you want to do with your time, do it, enjoy it without guilt, without moralizing it. Conversely, by the way, I see this, this is the more common source of distraction. It's not the things that people know are distractions, right? It's not the video games, it's not the social media. It's the stuff that tricks them into getting distracted without them noticing. Case in point, for years, I would sit down at my desk and I'd say, okay, now I'm going to get to work, right? I'm not going to procrastinate. I've got that big project I've been working on. I need to work on it right now. I can't keep delaying. Here I go. I'm going to do it right now. But first, let me check some email, right? <laughs> That's work related. It feels like work. Just, Looks yeah, like, it feels like work. Sounds like work. Yeah. Right. So what's the problem? I'm doing work. That's okay. But if it's not what you plan to do with your time, it is by definition a distraction. Right. So just because it feels like work, if it's not what you said you were going to do, you're working on the urgent and the uh, the, the, the easy tasks as opposed to the hard and important tasks. That's the most common form of distraction, the distraction that tricks us and we don't even realize we've gotten distracted. So that's so the, the big takeaway here is you can't call something a distraction unless you know what it distracted you from. You can't call something a distraction unless you know what it distracted you from. So if you have a big open calendar, right, a big open day and nothing but white space, everything's a distraction, right? W everything was a distraction. What did you plan to do? <laughs> so to answer your question around like, how do we decide what to do? We have to start with our values. We have to start with our values. What are values? 
Values are attributes of the person you want to become. Values are attributes of the person you want to become. So that means we have to sit down with ourselves. And, and I do this every week. It takes me exactly 15 minutes. Very quick thing to do. I do it every Sunday night. I sit down and I look at my schedule for the week ahead. And I talk about in the book, we can go into this in further detail about how you can use these three life domains to help make sure that you're living out your values, that you're spending your time in a way that is consistent with the person you want to become. And then what you do is you fill up your calendar. So you don't need to you know, create a vision board, don't need to think about like, oh, what do I wanna do in five years? That, that, that's too hard to do. People, most people will, will not do that. Uh, what you can do is let's start with tomorrow. Let's do next week. How would the person you want to become spend their time next week? And I want you to fill out that calendar based on these three life domains, you, your relationships, and then finally your work. And then by filling in your calendar based on how you want to spend your time to help you live according to your values, that becomes a game changer. Because now you have a physical artifact. You can look at your calendar and say, ah, everything on my calendar, that's traction. Everything else is distraction. Even if the traction is, hey, I want to watch Netflix, right? I want to play a video game. Great. That's exactly what you should be doing because it's on your calendar. You don't have to feel guilty about it. It's about putting that, turning your time, or sorry, turning your values into time by making time for traction. Yeah, I love how you talk about um, the sort of time boxing the calendar as um, a tactic. And I, I feel like it's a very, you have a very spicy take on to-do lists. With <laughs> I'd like you to talk a little bit more about like, why is a to-do list not as helpful as, as time boxing your calendar? I feel like that's yes. controversial. It is controversial. I call it the tyranny of the to-do list because I don't know about you. Uh, I kept to-do lists for years and they didn't freaking work. <laughs> I, in fact, I have never met anyone since I started this line of research. I've talked to a lot of people about to-do lists. I have never met even a single person who consistently finishes everything on their to-do list. People tell me, oh yeah, I do one or two things every day, but do you still have stuff on your to-do list? Oh yeah, I got a million things on my to-do list. So here's the problem with, with to-do lists. And let, me, and let me be very clear. I'm not against getting stuff out of your head and putting them on a piece of paper or an app. That's fine. You should do that. What I'm against is running your life on a to-do list. If you wake up in the morning and you ask yourself, ooh, what do I need to do today? And the first thing you look at is your to-do list rather than your schedule, that's where you've made a big mistake, right? Why are to-do lists so harmful? Why is running your life on a to-do list so, so harmful? There are a few reasons. Number one, there's no constraints. So with a to-do list, you can add more and more and more and more. There's no constraint. You can always add more tasks. So what happens? When we have no constraint, we add more and more stuff to our to-do list, more and more of these aspirations. And what happens is when we get to the end of our day and we haven't finished all those tasks on our to-do list, we look at the to-do list and we look at ourselves and we think, I still didn't do what I said I was going to do, loser. And that reinforcement of the fact that we did not live according to our commitments to ourselves, the fact that we didn't live with personal integrity day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, that reinforcement of that self-image has a very tragic toll. Eventually you hear people saying stupid things like, I'm no good at time management. I have a short attention span. I just, I'm not very good at productivity stuff. I'm not good at that. They start to internalize it thinking they're broken and it's not them that's broken. It's the technique that's broken. So that's one big problem. The, the second big problem I think is even worse is that even when we have leisure time, right? Even when we come home from work, we just want to relax. We want to watch Netflix. We want to hang out with our kids. We just want to take it easy when we use these to-do lists, we're still thinking about all the stuff we haven't finished. So even when we have leisure time, we're not enjoying it because our brains are somewhere else. We're thinking about the stuff still left undone. Ugh, As like opposed to- spying on me on my weekend. <laughs> yeah, welcome to the club, right? I use this technique <laughs> but for it, years. It feels, it does, right, it feels so much kinder to yourself to say like, hey, you know, you, don't, you didn't fail because you didn't get everything done on the to-do list. It's don't right. make a to-do list, right? That's right. So what people do is they measure themselves. We measure our self-worth based on, oh, look how many cute little boxes I checked off. So another thing that I hate about, about running your life on a to-do list is that when people look at their to-do list for the day, right? Do you think they do the hard work first? 
Of course not. They do the easy stuff. Oh yeah, check, 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 check. Look how great I am. Look how many boxes I checked off. Let me do the easy stuff. That the stuff that's not actually important, not the hard stuff, I'll do the easy stuff so I can get that sense of self-worth that, oh, look how many boxes I checked off. And the hard stuff, let me leave that for later. So, so as opposed to, so what's the alternative? Time boxing, keeping a schedule. So the goal of time boxing is to stop measuring yourself by things you finish, okay? This is gonna sound really crazy to people. I don't want you to measure yourself based on what you finished. It's not the to-do list technique. Oh, I finished, I finished, I finished, I finished. That's not the methodology here. Part of the reason, because there's no constraints with the to-do list, we never learn how long things take us to do. The research shows that the average task takes you three times longer than you think it will. Why? Because to-do lists don't, don't connect output with input, right? There's no connection between how long a task takes me. So people constantly chronically underestimate how long things take them. Instead, the new methodology is to plan how long you want to do a task without distraction. That's it. Not will I finish, but will I work on this task for as long as I said I would without distraction? It's not about finishing. It's about, I'm going to do this thing for 30 minutes. That's it. And I'm going to do nothing else. And here's the kicker. The people who do this technique, the people who just use this time boxing technique saying, I don't care if I'm going to finish. I'm just going to work on it without distraction. Nothing's going to stop me from doing just that thing for as long as I said I would. They finish more. They get more done than the to-do list people. Right. And it's so humane too. <laughs> that makes so much sense. Um, I love <laughs> right, what you're saying too about like the, oh, sorry, like the urgent versus the important. I feel like that's such an interesting distinction and it's so easy to just you know, say, well, I have, a, I'm so busy. I have all these urgent things that have to get done right now. Tick, 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 tick. And then like you said, the important, bigger, harder task, you know, it's still there at the end of the day. Right. Right. And it's, it's totally fine by the way, to make time for those urgent tasks. That's great. Right. So that's what we call reactive work versus reflective work. So reactive work is reacting to the emails, reacting to the meetings, reacting to the Slack notifications. I get it. That's part of your day. The problem is that most people want to be on autopilot the whole day. They want their inbox. They want slide. They complain about it, but they would much rather prefer being told what to do all day long because oh, I'm so busy. Everybody needs me. My boss, oh, the SMSs and the, and the texts and the, and the Slack, all this stuff needs my attention as opposed to stopping and saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me put some time in my calendar for what's called reflective work. Reflective work is the kind of work that can only get done without distraction creative tasks, planning, strategizing, thinking requires that you do it without distraction. So it's not that some of your day is not going to be spent doing reactive work. I get it. Your boss needs you. Your colleague needs you. Most of your day probably is going to be spent done doing reactive work. The problem is that most people make no time in their day for reflective work. So that time has to be scheduled and protected. That time to think is absolutely precious. And we have to make sure that time is, is scheduled to do that type of work or else if we don't, this is what I see all the time, people who are super busy running real fast in the wrong direction. And then they look back and say, what, what, what have I been doing? I've been doing the total wrong stuff. Well, because you never sat down and actually thought about, wait a minute, what do I need to be doing with my time and my life? Right, That's, I just had this conversation with somebody about how it's so easy not to put time to think on your calendar because it feels a little, silly or not, you know, like you can't really put on your work calendar time to think. Um, and yet we would all be so much better off actually, if we did. Yeah. And, um, and you see this among, among really high performance people, uh, in all various kinds of fields, you know, Bill Gates takes a think week. He doesn't do a think hour. Like I'm asking you to do, right. He takes a whole week <laughs> and goes off into some cabin and does nothing but read books and think and contemplate and actually ask himself, wait, how do I want to spend my time on earth? Because look, what he realizes is that you can always make more money, right? Bill Gates has all the money he'll ever need. And, and his, you know, generations would ever need, right? His constraint is not money because he realized you can always make more money. You cannot make more time. We all have the same 24 hours in the day. We're all cheap with our money, right? We, we won't buy an app on the app store because it's 99 cents. We're so cheap. We won't spend our money, but our time, ah, take it. Anybody who wants our time and attention, sure, take it free. <laughs> right. And so we need to flip that around. We need to be generous with our money, 
but cheap with our time. Um, I love that. And it reminds me so much of, <laughs> you know, the book, How to Do Nothing, Jenny O'Dell's book. It, it's yeah. like the sort of slower paced, more like staring at birds version of indistractable. Cause you both <laughs> write about so many of the same things and about how, you know, your attention is worth something. Your time is worth something. Don't just give it away without thinking about it. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's yeah. no coincidence that we use the same words to describe time and money, right? Did you notice that? Like we, spend we make it. time just like we make money. We spend time just like we spend money. We pay attention, right? Just like we would pay with dollars and cents. That's not a coincidence. That's so interesting. Um, I, I also, I want to make sure that we, um, because I personally want to know the answer to this. So, and this is about me. So I want to talk about, you, you write in the book about how we can raise indistractable kids, which I feel like is, feels so crucial, especially in this moment when, you know, most of our, or a lot of our kids are going to school online. They're on devices all the time. Um, but I feel like you talk about re helping our kids to be indistractable in, in a very tech positive way, which I appreciate. Um, and so maybe you can talk a little bit more about that and about what you mean by, in the book you write about psychological nutrients. Like, what do you mean? Yeah, yeah. So half the book is about what you can do yourself, how you can become indistractable. And I will say that is the best piece of advice that I can give a parent uh, a manager is to set the example, right? If you're the boss, if you manage other people, if you're the, the boss of your household, if you're a parent, it's about leading by example. That I meet so many parents who tell me, oh, my kid's addicted to Fortnite, won't stop playing video games or whatever the case might be. And as they're telling me this, they're saying, oh, I just got to check this one thing at work, this one. No, you know, kids see that. Kids, ki kids come equipped with what we call a hypocrisy detection device. They have these little sensors and they're always looking for when you're a hypocrite, <laughs> right? Okay. So we have to stop that. We have to lead by example. So half the book is about what you can do as an individual to become indistractable. The other half of the book, the second part, is all about the various contexts and relationships we work under. So for example, how do we build an indistractable workplace? That yeah, I can tell you all these techniques to become indistractable yourself, but what if your boss insists on calling you at 9 p.m.? Well, that's not the technology, that's your boss. <laughs> that's the company culture you work at. So what do we do about that? How do we change company culture? Uh, it's, uh, there's a section on how to have indistractable relationships. And then there's also a section on how to raise indistractable kids, uh, which I think is, is, to me, is the most important section of the book because it's about future generations. That, you know, if you think the world is distracting now, <laughs> just wait you know, just wait a few years, right? When we have virtual reality and augmented reality and who knows what other realities, the world is only going to become a more distracting place. And I really do believe that this is the skill of the century that uh, kids who learn how to be indistractable will have a huge competitive advantage over the kids who don't learn how to be indistractable. As they grow up as it, it, and become adults, that, that skill of the century, the skill to know how to decide for yourself how you will spend your time and attention versus letting other people control your time and attention. This will be the critical skill because it's, it's a macro skill, right? You can't, you can't learn and grow and uh, if you can't focus and pay attention. And so it's, it's an absolutely critical skill. The problem is, I think, you know, myself included here as a, as a father of a 12 year old, I assumed the problem was the technology, right? Like kids are crazy. Well, I'm not crazy, so it must have been something new, right? My generation is just fine. It must have been something new. What's new? Oh, it's these devices. I didn't have this as a kid, so this must be the source of the problem. Of course, that's completely ridiculous because our parents said the same thing about us, right? For me, it was the television was melting our brains, couch potatoes. We were all called couch potatoes and, uh, you know, Nintendo. And before that, it was heavy metal. Before that, it was rock and roll. Before that, it was comic books. I mean, you know, you look yeah. back at the history of moral panics, every generation, all the way back to Socrates, who's talked about how the written word was going to enfeeble men's minds. Every generation thinks the next generation is being, you know, their brains are being hijacked by some technology. And the problem is, it's such an easy excuse, right? We always do this. We always do this. We think, oh, those kids are acting crazy because of that substance, because of that thing, because of that technology. Uh, the best example I put about, I put in the book, which I've got a lot of, uh, uh, controversy over, even though the research is pretty well un, uh, unequivocal, is the sugar high. 
right? Doesn't every, that is, every parent, that is a little shocking. Yeah. Right? Every parent knows that if kids eat sugar, right. they're going to act crazy, right? They're going to be hyperactive. Right. No, it's not true. It is a complete myth. If you don't believe me, type into Google, is the sugar high a myth? And you will see there have been meta studies, studies of studies that show the evidence is overwhelming. There is no such thing as a sugar high. It does not make kids act crazy. Let me tell you what it does. It makes parents act crazy. There have been studies that find that when parents are told their children were given sugar, even when they weren't, they rate their kids' behavior as worse. They follow them around, they helicopter, they, they, they apologize for, oh, my kid is so crazy. It's because of the sugar, it's because of the cupcakes, even though they weren't given sugar. So it has this effect on our parents. And this is exactly what is happening with technology today. We are using it as the scapegoat and we are ignoring the deeper issues of what is going on with our kids. And what's really going on with our kids is they are deficient in these three psychological nutrients. So sorry for that long setup, but let me explain the, the, what, what these psychological nutrients are. Yeah. So the most widely accepted, most widely uh, studied theory of human flourishing is called self-determination theory. And this has been around for what, over 40 years now. Uh, self-determination theory says that every human being on the face of the earth needs these three things. We need a sense of mastery, we need a sense of autonomy, and we need a sense of relatedness. These are just like we have you know, carbohydrates, fat, and protein for our bodies. For our minds, for our sense of well-being, in order for us to flourish, we need these three psychological nutrients. Adults, children, everybody needs them. Mastery, autonomy, and relatedness. If you look at kids' lives today, they are severely deficient in these three psychological nutrients. And so what they are doing to gain these psychological nutrients, right? When you're deficient in a vitamin, you crave that food, right? And so that's what's happening with our children. They are deficient in a sense of mastery, autonomy, and relatedness. And in response, they are going online. So the, the, their online behavior is a symptom of a, uh, of a deeper dysfunction of the real disease. Right, I, I think especially autonomy is so hard, I think with a lot of today's kids, um, that's really interesting. And I love how you talk about how, you know, for our kids and for ourselves, digital detox isn't the answer. Um, which I find really satisfying because you know, I always, whenever someone's like, I just threw my smartphone out the window and I don't go online anymore. It seems like, well, that's nice for you. Do you yeah. not have you know, a I mean, I think digital or... detoxes, <laughs> It's the same, it's the same silliness of, 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 you know, the, the food detoxes. Oh, I'm going to eat cayenne right. pepper and, uh, you know, lemon juice. And now I'm going to lose weight. That's going to change my habits for the rest it of my life. No, it's ridiculous. Long. Yeah. Yeah. It's first of all, lucky you, that's very privileged that you get to do that, right? Like the rest of us have to be on social media. We have to use email because we have jobs. <laughs> so it's really easy for, you know, some professor to say, oh, stop using social media when they don't have to use it for their job. So that's not very helpful. Uh, and then two, it's a temporary solution. So just like, you know, these detox diets don't help you lose weight long-term, all the weight comes back on very quickly, right? After you stop the diet, why do we think a temporary digital detox will do anything for us? Now, if you want to plan that time, in your week to say, hey, look, you know, this is what I do. I have four hours in my day on, on a weekend on Saturdays with my daughter, four hours planned with my daughter. Now, I don't know what we're going to do for those four hours, right? I, I don't know. We, we call it planned spontaneity. We might go to the park. We might go get some ice cream. We might, I don't know what we're going to do at that time, but I know what I will not be doing with that time. I will not be on my phone. I will not be checking email. I will not be looking at social media because I have protected that time and, and committed uh, to spend that time with my daughter, to be both present in body and mind. So I think that's a good idea because I'm living out my values. But to make your values based on, ooh, I have so much self-control, I'm not going to check my phone, when you know you need it for your job eventually, I think that's a temporary Band-Aid solution. Right. I, I think you've also written and talked about how people um, seem to love to believe that technology is more powerful than our brains and is controlling us. Um, and it is, it's sort of satisfying to say like, oh yeah, I, I don't know. It's Twitter is so crazy. I can't look away. Um, but why, I mean, why do we love that myth so much that it's like smarter than we are? 
Yeah, it's um. So we we definitely love this myth. <laughs> and so we, satisfying, we, like it's not it's me. So Sorry. Absolutely, absolutely. Because you know when there is an addiction, when we use that term, uh, now there's a dealer, there's a pusher, there's someone who's doing it to me, right? Well, my kids, oh, they act all crazy. It's because they're addicted to video games. Oh, you know what? I, I, I'm so addicted to YouTube. I just, I just lost track of time, right? Because now it's not me. It's someone doing it to me. But of course, when we call it what it really is, for the vast majority of people, remember, an addiction is a pathology. We don't talk about epilepsy or Tourette's this way. Well, why does everybody think suddenly they're all addicted? An addiction is a pathology. And yet we're somehow all addicted to everything. My, my wife got a box of, of shoes from DSW, right? The shoe store. The box says on the side, danger, addictive contents inside. Like everything somehow is addictive. I think it's incredibly disrespectful to people who actually suffer from the pathology of addiction. And the addiction is a terrible disease. Yeah. And yet we toss around this term. Second, it's incredibly disempowering. Because when you say, oh, there's nothing I can do about it, it's an addiction, guess what? You stop trying. You don't do anything about it. Right. And we know the number one determinant of whether someone will recover after rehab, alcoholics, they did the study, the number one determinant of whether they will recover is not the level of physical dependency. It's not what's happening in their bodies. It's their perception of their ability to change. It's what's in their heads. It's what's in their brains, their desire or their, their perception of can they change? So when people think, oh, my brain is being hijacked, I'm being addicted, uh, guess what? That's exactly what the tech companies want. They want you to think there's nothing you can do. Right. Um, that's so, that's really fascinating. And I feel like very empowering to think about it that way. Um, Thank you. That, that, that was the goal. That was the goal that, that uh, we can, we really can use these tools uh, in a way that uh, benefits us as opposed to feeling like we're enslaved by them. It's really about understanding for a second, wait a minute, let's, let's stop and understand how to use these tools in a way that serves us as opposed to us serving them. I mean, you know, people will spend more time reading the instruction manual to their blender or their microwave than they will figuring out how to use these devices that we're staring at all day in a way that serves us. And so that's really the manual I wanted to write, that for people who are interested in this, for people who say, look, yeah, I want the technology. The technology is awesome. It helps me connect with people. I can be more productive. I can be more happy. I can do more in life. I can form good habits with my technology. But yeah, how do I break those bad habits? Uh, how do I make sure that, that the technology serves me as opposed to me serving it? Yeah, and it's interesting just to bring it back to the beginning that you were saying, um, you know, for example, that writing on Medium helps you to formulate ideas or to work on a, a, a next book or to develop, you know, to have this conversation with readers. It's something amazing that you can do online in real time is have this conversation with people and deepen the conversation and the thinking. Um, and that's the same technology that sometimes we're like, oh no, it's hijacking my brain. You know, it Completely. has two sides. I mean, can you imagine for a minute what this would have been like? Let's let's imagine for a second that it wasn't COVID nineteen. Let's say it was COVID ninety. <laughs> let's say that let's say this pandemic happened thirty years before. Okay, I've been thinking about that all year. Like how much oh worse? Oh my god! Would this be? You, <laughs> it yeah. would have been a million times worse. Yeah. It would have been literally a matter of life and death. We could not have worked from home. We can't be calling in from you're you're in New York. I'm in Singapore right now, using this right. amazing technology for basically free, <laughs> right? Like, so just blaming and shaming uh, the technology and ourselves can't be the answer. That's right. Um, what's next for you? Is there another aspect of behavioral design that you're fascinated with next or that you're planning to write about next? Can we just- Yeah, that? thanks for asking. I, yeah, so I uh, will continue to publish on Medium every week. I've really enjoyed the the, the cadence and the, um, the community has been fantastic. It's like I mentioned, it's it's my ability. I think, you know, I think a lot of authors are hesitant, um, at least in the old version of, of being an author, is that like, I don't want to give away my good ideas, right? I don't want to put them out there. And I think actually that's completely wrong, that I have benefited so much by putting out those ideas that I think the community on Medium appreciates that, yeah, the, the, this is, the, this is the, 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 um, the in-progress version of these ideas. Uh, that it's not fully baked, the book is fully baked, but the ideas as I'm processing through them, I'm putting them up on, on uh, Medium and getting that feedback from the community, making these ideas better and better so that they're more practical and, and that people can actually you know, utilize them in their day-to-day -day lives. That's what I'm gonna continue to do. And 
at some point there'll be some problem that uh, the research doesn't fix for me, right? And this is what happened with Indistractable. I had this problem and I said, okay, I really need to get to the bottom of this. Why is this a constant struggle? So I read all the books on this topic that I could possibly find. I looked through all the research I could get my hands on. I, and when those popular books that said, oh, just get rid of your phone, stop using social media, when those solutions didn't work for me, that's when I decided, you know what, I need to, I need to figure this out for myself, right? And so at some point, I'm sure there will be something along the way that, uh, that, that I can't find the solution for, and that'll probably be the next book. I love that. And I love the idea of writing towards questions. I feel like that's where really interesting books come from, where really interesting medium posts come from. Um, and just when we sort of write with, with questions in mind and like a true curiosity, it's where really interesting ideas pop up. So I love that. Absolutely. And I love yeah, there's the, that. That sorry that the um, community for Medium is work at Medium is working for you because I, I know I'm biased, but I feel like we have the smartest readers and commenters on the it's, internet. It's maybe no, it's fantastic. I I love interacting with the community on Medium, and I, I think back to your your what you said earlier about about curiosity. There's a wonderful uh, uh, quote that I always keep in mind that the the cure for boredom is curiosity. There is no cure for curiosity. <laughs> Right, like if you follow that curiosity, if you follow that itch, that's that drive. That's a great example of how we can use an internal trigger to drive us towards traction rather than distraction. Right, some people when they have a burning curiosity, a burning question, they they want quick relief. They want to escape it. I don't want to think about it. You think too much. Right, that's something I've been told my whole life. <laughs> you think too much. Me you know? too. No, but, <laughs> but but by, so by by exploring these questions, I think this is how we get to a conclusion. And I think it's such a gift, like as a writer, that's that flame that you have to keep lit, right? You have to constantly feed that curiosity uh, because it's exciting, right? Like that's the whole fun of the job. Right. Okay, well, that's exciting. I'm gonna keep uh, watching your Medium post to see what book is coming next. Um, <laughs> thank you so much, Nir. This is so interesting. You always have such great ideas and really tactical advice that's so helpful um, oh, and I'm so excited to hear that you're gonna keep writing on medium and hopefully we'll keep talking absolutely thank you so much this was thanks great so I really much. enjoyed it thank you thanks and thanks everyone for coming